Hello, my name is Miguel Amado. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am the director of Sirius, uh, an arts organization based in Cove, County Cork, Ireland. And it's uh, my great pleasure and my great honor to welcome uh, Gregor Chalet, a well-known, uh, renowned artist, writer, activist and uh, educator who is, the, who is leading our first summer school here in Cove. Um, we are going to develop a body of um, sessions around themes of art and politics, particularly focusing on Greg's forthcoming book, uh, which will be published uh, later in the summer, which touches upon issues of act activist art, uh, not only today, but also in terms of its recent history. And we are also uh, joined by other speakers, including myself, uh, Carlos Garrido Castellano, who is a lecturer at the University College Cork, who has been working around activist art and the, the decolonial, as well as Georgia Perkins, who is a PhD student at the Visual Cultures Department at Goldsmiths University of London and also curatorial fellow here at Sirius, who will be uh, delivering also a series of uh, talks and discussions um, where we want to uh, translate some of uh, Greg's key ideas into our local context, focusing on themes of the housing crisis or themes that relate to the role of the artist and the art worker today in Ireland. We are being joined by a group, a very interesting and diverse group of artists and educators based in County Cork or in Cork City, but also elsewhere in Ireland. And we are hoping that this uh, series of uh, conversations is going to be really important um, towards the development of a, a larger critical mass with respect to the relationship between art and politics locally and beyond. Well, my own practice as an artist is a studio practice, actually. Uh, and even though it does have a kind of political uh, aspect to it, I would not call it activist art. I wouldn't call it community art. But I've also worked with a number of artist collectives. And I've also spent a lot of time thinking about activist art, which I think, in a certain sense, the kind of more militant definition is the one I kind of gravitate towards. And I'll try to explain that. Uh, and then also socially engaged or social practice art, which I see as a kind of broader uh, concept, really, with activist art being a part of that, but not necessarily the same thing. I don't know if that is useful or not, but we'll see what we can. I, let's see if we can get this to work. And I do have a uh, presentation. I can. Well, it's not a presentation. It's more like some images that I can throw up just to sort of support some things. And it's here somewhere. Ah. I mean, I'm all the way at the end, so I'm going to scroll back. You get to see the entire show in reverse. All right. So another definition, throw this out there. Lucy R. Lepard, in 1984, talking about activist art uh, in terms of a kind of deception, I guess, is, is one way to look at it, a kind of decep a deception. It looks like art or something aesthetic or something beautiful, but when it actually gets into play, it's doing something quite different. And so she uses the concept of the Trojan horse. Mm -hmm. If you know Lepard's work, she's really well known. Uh, for having, you might say, really documented conceptual art at its very beginning in, in New York City in particular, but she had a, a, a larger reach than just New York. And interestingly enough, and I have a chapter in the book on this, she actually runs into a group of artists in Argentina in 1968 uh, who basically tell her, look, uh, we're not going to be making art anymore until we can get rid of the dictatorship that we're living under at the time, right? 1968 Argentina. And so she's, she's like, well, what do you mean? Like, you're, you're not going to make art? And this, like, really threw her, right? Or we're only going to make art that could be extremely sort of useful politically, you know, almost kind of like in this question of, like, OK, it's, it's got one purpose, and that is to overthrow the dictatorship. Uh, I think it, it, it sort of surprised her and shocked her. And when she got back to New York and she looked at the people who were doing this kind of conceptual art, she sort of began to think, well, what is it, you know, that people are really trying to do? For her, conceptual art was an attempt to sort of withdraw 
some aspects of art that were commodified in the art market, and therefore to kind of find another way to make art that was more more like part of life, maybe more political. I mean, you could look at it different ways. Uh, it wasn't too long until she also said they had to come to the conclusion that even this art that was trying to withdraw from art was already becoming part of the art world and commodified in its own way. And that's another whole long discussion we could have about commodification. But it threw her in such a way that she started to think about, well, what other ways could artists be engaged in changing the world, not just changing art? Um, I'm going to throw this one up too, which is much more recent from just a few years before COVID. The phenomenon of art activism is central to our time because it is a new phenomenon, quite different from the phenomenon of critical art that became familiar to us during recent decades. And he's talking uh, in the second part about conceptual art or about institutional critique as a kind of part of conceptual art. So Groys, who is a Russian uh, theorist and philosopher, uh, is sort of really almost kind of um, saying something that it seems almost on its face contradictory. How could there be no history to something called activist art? How does it just emerge as a new phenomena, right? And I think that's one of the provocations that I've been working with in the last few years, thinking about what he's trying to say and actually coming to sort of a weird split decision. On the one hand, yes, uh, you know, there is something new about this phenomena, and on the other hand, it has a history that goes way, way back. When the people came to me from Lund Humphreys, the publisher, and said, would you be interested in writing a short introduction to conceptual, uh, to, excuse me, to, to activist art uh, for this new series we're doing? I said, yeah, I mean, no problem. I was like extremely arrogant, stupid. I've been doing this for years, and I'll write this in no time and I'll get back to you. And then COVID happened, the lockdown happened, George Floyd's killing sparked uh, monu what I call monumenticides around the world, you know, statues, memorials to white supremacy, to slaveholders being torn down. And I realized that the whole concept of the book that I had sort of talked to them about and I'd given them an outline was like out the window, you know. Not all of it, but a lot of it. I really had to rethink what I was going to do. And so really in isolation now, in lockdown, I'm like rethinking and rewriting this concept. And I went all the way back to the Haitian Revolution and looked at sort of that aspect of the you know history of colonialism and decolonialism. Uh, why is it that the Haitian Revolution is so sort of underrepresented in the arena of, let's say, politics around revolutionary ideas and in the arts? Um, I went back to Corbet, who was, of course, uh, Gustave Corbet, the painter, who was like everybody's kind of go-to person for activist, if you want to call it that, or political art, but also an activist, right? Because he was involved in the Paris Commune, and he actually took part in, as you probably know, pulling down the Vendome column. He was fined for that. He had to leave the country. He died, uh, you know, basically without ever paying it, but he died basically, you know, uh, you know, sort of ashamed and not able to come back to, uh, to France from, from Switzerland. So he paid a huge price for his activism. Was his painting also activism? You know, this is this is an interesting question. Some artists, historians, friends of mine say, "Well, look at those late paintings. You know, the fruit is rotting in the bowl, and you know, there's a sense that something has happened here." These are interesting interesting questions to me in, in, in many different ways. Um, but to get back to the book, I mean, here I'm I'm writing this book, and then I gave them the manuscript. And they just said, oh, this is interesting, but we wanted a book on contemporary art. Uh, sorry, you know, isn't that what you promised? And so I said, yeah, I guess you're right. I went back and I tore the whole thing apart, tore out all these older chapters and rewrote it. And what you have there is really what resulted uh, certainly at least a year and a half or two later than it was supposed to have been completed. And it's such a short book that you probably could read it like in a day but it took a lot of time to get get to that point. But I give you this backstory because this question of um, legacy or what does history have to do with activist art? Because in a certain sense, if you think of activist art as precisely being a kind of engaged, useful art that gets things done, right, as opposed to something that's aesthetically contemplated, then it doesn't need a history. Well, who, who needs a history to that? It's, it's about the moment, 
right? And whatever it does, it becomes kind of useless in any sort of historical sense. But I don't really completely agree with that. And I, and I think this, this is kind of the mapping of the book in, in a certain sense, is to sort of substitute, or not even substitute, to sort of challenge the notion of history with the concept of the archive. Right? Uh, and in this sense, in my sense, being that the archive is not structured, uh, it's not sort of narrativized, it doesn't have a linear thread, whereas history mm, almost always has some sort of narrative process to it, right? It's being told from a certain kind of perspective. So this is a little simplistic, but thinking of the archive as a kind of counter-historical way of looking at the past or looking at memories. Right? And that's a really key theme that goes on in the book. Kim Charnley, who's a contemporary British art historian and theorist, uh, art, activist art functions as a glitch within art history that threatens to invert the figure and ground of the narrative. Precisely what I'm sort of kind of aiming at here is that activist art, in my reading of it, jumps out of the project of his, history in a sense, jumps out, sets itself aside, problematizes the notion of art history. Now I'll back up just a little bit more. So I said that I was an, an artist, and I studied visual art. I did not study art history until more recently, and not even really officially, I don't consider myself an art historian. So, But I studied visual art. Uh, I studied with an artist, German artist Hans Hacke in 19, late 1970s, became involved in artist collectives, in the early 80s, then again in the 90s, doing work while I was making my own work, but also working collectively and politically on various projects around housing issues. Well, we did a lot of work around confronting gentrification in New York City on the Lower East Side at the time, which you know, I can say now if you visited there or if you visit there, it, there's no trace of the anti-gentrification project. It's all become, you know, highly gentrified. But, which is to say, if activist art is useful and meant to sort of accomplish something, it's probably not doing a very good job. Mm -hmm. um, the other projects that I worked on was a project where we reconsidered historical uh, events and people that had been erased from the streets of New York City. And we actually put street signs up and talked about those people and events for like temporary, temporarily, like for one year we had a permit to put them up and then we did it again uh, until Rudolf Giuliani tried to stop, shut us down and then we fought back and we got them up. Anyway, it's a whole lecture in itself. The group was called Repo History, one more Repo History. You're welcome to look it up. It actually comes from the, from the movie Repo Man. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I recommend it. It could be your homework. Um, and then more recently with Gulf Labor Coalition. Gulf Labor Coalition arose when an island off Abu Dhabi was being considered for sort of really what you might call like in sci-fi terms terraforming from literally a desert island into sort of a, a paradise with golf courses and waterfalls and greenery and fabulous museums and schools. New York University, the British Museum, uh, the Louvre, and the Guggenheim. And the Guggenheim being one that would concentrate on contemporary art, a whole lot of contemporary artists pivoting on people who come from the Middle East said, if you're going to build a museum here in Abu Dhabi, in the Emirates, you need to do it with fair labor contracts. Because if you know anything about the labor conditions there, it's, it's horrendous. Uh, most of the people who do the physical work are brought in from other countries, Pakistan, India, uh, Egypt to some extent. And they're given very big promises and when they get there, their passports are sometimes confiscated so they can't escape. Uh, they have a visa fees that they have to pay um, for maybe three years. So all the wages that they thought they were gonna return to the family are, are taken away and they can't organize. And we said, you know, you're gonna build a contemporary art museum which is headquartered in New York City and you want to show work of contemporary artists, well, sorry, you're going to have to do this with fair labor practices that we would expect in most parts of the world, certainly Europe, US, etc. And so this became a battle, and we fought them in a very militant way, in some cases, over the years, including taking over the Peggy Guggenheim uh, Museum in uh, Venice during the biennial in 2015, um, and holding it down until they agreed to certain demands. Um, so those are my sort of mm, uh, bona fides from sort of the area of collectivism and activism in a way, right? What I bring to it. 
I'm not saying that that's the only way you can look at this kind of work, but it's the way I, I approach it. And um, that's why I sort of get into this question of the archive. Where does this work come from? Does it have a history? And just the last uh, quote here from Martha Rosler, which is a broader question, right? The artistic imagination continues to dream of historical agency. And I like this for a lot of reasons because it also sort of almost contradicts what I was just saying. It definitely has the feeling of something historical, right? Like the idea that what motivates history is something about liberation or emancipation. And this is, of course, a very classic notion which we could uh, you know, assign to all kinds of forms of political vanguardism and also certainly the artistic vanguard in a really important way. Um, so, okay. When I started off with the book, it's, 20, 20, it's 2019, going into 2020. And in 2020, uh, an art magazine, Art Review, out of, the, out of the UK, does its Power 100. I'm sure you're familiar with these things. Everybody has the top 20 influencers in the art world. This is the Power 100. And I was struck by the fact that Black Lives Matter was the top influencer in the art world, according to this particular magazine. And that Me Too movement is number four. Right? And I'm thinking to myself, so much of the work that I've done with activist art and people that I know doing activist art has, doesn't appear in art history books, right? You don't find it in art history books. It's just not there. Right? Uh, so how is it all of a sudden that major indices of the art world are like talking about activist art now as a major influencer? Not even activist art, because you could say that Black Lives Matter certainly has an aesthetic dimension, and it was started by uh, at least one of the people that started it was an artist, and a lot of artists involved, but you wouldn't necessarily call it an artist's group per se. So what is that about? How does this, how does this relate to these questions that Boris Groys raises, or Martha Rosler for that matter, right? Um, second, uh, this, is, this is my forensic presentation, uh, second bit of evidence for you to, to chew on. You can go on, and if you have your phones, you know, you can do this and try it. You can go to a website that the Tate has set up where you get to sort of play a quiz that um, directs you to, uh, or tells you which art collective you would belong to. So they ask you a series of questions, which involves, you know, uh, you know, who would be in your collective and what would be your objectives? You know, and many of you have already mentioned certain things and what artists do you like? And then after a certain point, you click a button and out comes the answer. And generally speaking, they have two art collectives set up. One is the Black Audio Collective from Britain in the 1970s, Black Film and Audio Collective. And the other is the Hackney Flashers, which was a feminist art collective focused on photography from, from London, also uh, really late 70s, early 80s. There are also other collectives, though, because when I did the test, I went into the Ancients, which is a, a group from, like I said, the pre-Raphaelite era. Uh, so how, you know, here's the guy who's doing all this activist art, and I'm like psh, off into the 19th century. I don't know how that worked. But I, I encourage you to try doing the test, right? What's also interesting, and, and you know, note, of course, we're talking about the Tate here. This is not some peripheral organization. This is like one of the pillars of the contemporary art world and the art world in general. You scroll down to the bottom of the page, and they have all kinds of examples of uh, artist collectives, many of them fairly political. The Gorilla Girls, for example, Art Cobra. It's no, not all highly political, but some are EAT, High Red Center, Japanese Collective, and so on and so forth. Um, and what was really striking to me was, because uh, I, I looked at the back end of the website and realized when this was put together, and I've, I've written to them, and they haven't gotten back to me at this point, so don't expect it. As this site was being put together, workers at the Tate were being uh, threatened with, uh, with, with being fired, and many of them were out striking and protesting and picketing against the museum. And it occurred to me that you know, most of these uh, groups that they highlight on, the, on their website would have been out on the picket line themselves. You know, they would have just walked out, leaving nothing for their web page, I guess. Right? And it struck me it's also interesting that this wave of 
critiques. This is the Bilbao, Guggenheim Bilbao people uh, in the, uh, I think these are, these are actually the, the cafeteria workers who are protesting the museum. The education uh, department also was uh, protesting not that many years ago. And we have the same phenomenon going on across, uh, across the country. Uh, this is actually the Museum of Natural History in New York, where uh, a monument to uh, Teddy Roosevelt has been removed or is, about, is, is in the process of being removed because of its racist content. Racist, certainly it's an interpretation, uh, but you have Teddy Roosevelt astride you know, an equestrian sculpture, and then two people of color, one a Native American and one an African, probably Maasai warrior, walking beside him like they're sort of his guides. You may have heard about this, and it's been a controversial for years uh, in New York City. So between these kind of actions against museums, which are really fascinating, that the staff of museums would like would strike against the museum. Uh, in New York, we've had this happening first at the New Museum, where I worked for a year myself um, before being fired. It's another story. Um, we had it then at the, went to the Guggenheim, went to the Whitney. Uh, the Museum of Modern Art has actually been unionized since 1960s, and that's another interesting story because of the period, period of time, uh, you know, a lot of discussion was going on around museum's responsibility to their employees, etc. And then it started to spread from New York to the West Coast, and now the entire United States museums, left and right, are organizing. Um, the, and when I say organizing, I'm talking about the, the sort of lower end staff, not the senior staff, not, not, not in most cases curators, although in one case curators also were trying to organize. And it's really been fascinating to see this process for me, especially with a background of having worked with Hans Hacke, who is known for having been one of the people that established institutional critique, and having to ask the question, right, many of the people working in these museums, especially at the level of, say, the, you know, uh, membership, uh, you know, coat check, uh, installation crews for sure, sometimes cafeteria, sometimes security, are people who actually studied art often visual art, sometimes uh, art history. And they were of a generation who had studied people like Hans Hacke, and then the second generation of institutional critique, Andrea Fraser and Fred Wilson. And my sort of analysis is they are literally manifesting a new form of institutional critique, but not as art per se, but actually in the very structure of the art institution. You know? Applying, even if it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship, it's applying those ideas directly within their own context. Not that the idea of organizing for labor reasons isn't sufficient, it is, but it's interesting to see it in this context. And comes back to this question. Okay, is there a history to activist art? So are these people like thinking this through or is it simply that they have imbibed in a sense through their studies and through experiences the notion of the institution as a place to be political? within the cultural sphere. Because you don't really see this, let's say, in medical profession, you don't see this in other professions, you see it in the arts in a particular way. Um, and then the monumenticide process, which I started to talk about, is also fascinating. Like, what does it mean to erase these historical um, markers to the past? Of course, they're always being put uh, in place in a particular way. Pick you know, funneling uh, the idea of history in a particular way. What does it mean to take away those markers and what is it that you expect afterwards? What's left? Often what's left, of course, is the plinth that the sculpture was on. In this case, it's being officially removed. In many cases, they're being pulled down. I'm sure you saw lots of images like this in 2020. What's left is the part that is really hard to remove, which is the part that digs way down into the ground and you have this kind of like weird like pedestal or plinth or something often spray painted with BLM, George Floyd, whatever. Interesting change of landscape and what does that tell us about this idea of dreaming maybe of another kind of future. In some cases people also erect counter memorials. In this case in Colombia and I misspelled Colombia there's some 
please excuse me. Uh, interestingly enough, I see that uh, a leftist has just won the Colombian election, I believe, just yesterday maybe it was announced. Uh, but in this case, putting up a sort of, you know, counter memorial uh, in, in the middle of uh, a very contested political site. So all of this is happening, and then there's a kind of contingent of activism taking place outside the institution, in the street, supporting many of these same ideas, supporting the people who are striking for better wages. But they're not only striking for better wages, and I think this is important. They're often asking for an end to uh, racial problems within, or sexist problems within the institution, or microaggressions. It's quite clear that they want more than just a better working uh, standard of living. They want working conditions to change. And I think that's also very fascinating. And here's a good example. This is the Whitney Museum in, in New York. And the people on, uh, on the staff, so like 100 staff members, this is in 2019, 2018, sorry, 100 staff members wrote a letter to their own bosses saying, we demand that uh, two of the board members step down. Uh, one of them was Warren Canders. I'll explain why. But let's stop a second and think, what does it mean for staff members, and this is, includes curators, includes other kinds of staff members to, to write a letter like that, and they're not unionized. This was before they actually created a union. I mean, there's absolutely nothing to prevent them from being fired. It's an interesting level of risk taken by cultural workers to demand that they change the upper structure of the museum, in this case, what they were calling toxic board members, and I'll explain. So Warren Candors was actually the chair of the board of the Whitney, and he also happened to be head of a company, and I, I, this, is, this is absolutely true, it's actually called Safari Land. You can look it up, Safari Land. And Safari Land produces what is considered uh, sort of, quote, non-lethal military weapons, really. Such things as tear gas canisters, uh, rubber bullets, and so on and so forth. These were being used at this time in the US under the Donald Trump administration against people seeking uh, you know, sanctuary in the US from Central America in particular, coming through Mexico. So from El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, those kind of places. And not just men, but also men and women and children being tear gassed and in some case hit with these kind of uh, rubber bullets, right? Also being used in the Gaza Strip by the Israeli Defense Forces against Palestinian activists. So, okay, we set the stage. There's the mise en scene, a museum, cultural institution, a board member, a rather prestigious and important board member in terms of the museum, connected to some very, very troubling kinds of political and sort of uh, uh, militaristic sort of, uh, sort of uh, corporations and, and production, and uh, a staff who rather than see themselves as simply neutral reproducers of the art venue, the white cube, believed it was absolutely their job, in a sense, maybe, or their political necessity, their ethical necessity, to do something to try to change the situation. The letter is written, it, it gets out. It wasn't really intended for public view, but somehow it gets leaked, of course, very quickly. The art world is, you know, if nothing else, a world of gossip and quick exchange, and it's all over the place. Um, and then groups of activists who are connected to the art world, but let's say they're outside, in a sense, the institution, begin to sort of create agitation in support of the staff, who, as I understand it, were maybe not completely sure they wanted that going on, but it happened. And every week, a group that called itself Decolonize This Place went to the Whitney Museum and staged a demonstration in the lobby, including burning uh, incense in the lobby and creating chants and all kinds of things. So imagine inside there's a group of people queuing up to get tickets to go see the exhibition. Uh, in this case, it was the, an Andy Warhol retrospective. And meanwhile, people are like demonstrating and creating all kinds of like discussions and shouting in the lobby. Ultimately, a lot of things happen, but ultimately, Candor's steps down. And so, coming back to this question of utility, all of this activity did lead to something concrete. Does that change 
Radically, the art world, does it change the museum? Maybe not. But symbolically, it's significant. And it's interesting to see that this combination of sort of interior critique and exterior critique led to that process. It also didn't happen until a number of artists in the Biennale, which they have every two years, the biennial, excuse me, uh, decided to pull their work out of the show. Artists of color, mostly, not entirely. And that really sort of was the coup de grace. Other people like um, Laurie Jo Reynolds, who um, really helped with a whole group of people and a whole series of activist works, including things like this, which is a street stencil, but you use mud to create the actual stencil, so that, of course, it's a temporary kind of tattoo on the street. But she actually helped shut down this prison, which was a high security prison where people were put in solitary confinement uh, in absolutely horrible conditions for like even a year maybe or several years in solitary confinement. And uh, so Lori Jo and her activist group shut down the prison. Again, another example in which an artistic practice, and in this case a quite expanded practice, so it wasn't just this kind of immediate street graphics, but it was also working with people legislatively in, uh, in Illinois to try to get it shut down, writing, uh, having a writing campaign of people in the prison, uh, back and forth with people outside the prison. But the campaign that went on for several years finally uh, shut the prison down, which I think is quite amazing. And so on and so forth. I mean, artists doing work in the streets during Black Lives Matter protests, and again, uh, you know, the eyes of Eric Garner, who you maybe remember was murdered by the police uh, before George Floyd in, in, in New York City because he was selling what are called Lucy's, they're just individual cigarettes, and he was put in a chokehold and, and he died. Uh, he was not armed, he did, you know, did nothing else except try to sell cigarettes on the street. Uh, the eyes of Eric Garner in a demonstration, a Black Lives Matter demonstration, being carried through the street. Native American people uh, celebrating the fact that when Biden was elected president, they actually, he, he decided to shut down the Dakota Pipeline, which was being protested because it went through Sioux territory and other Native people's territory. And uh, it's not only sacred land, but the potential for polluting the land was tremendous. And I just want to sort of call attention here, in terms of these images, just the aesthetic range, the visual range of, of this stuff. And I say here aesthetic also in the, in the broadest terms of the kind of sensual experience, right, of the world, right? Not just, uh, not just optics, but all kinds of things. Demonstrations with sound, demonstrations with movement. And I'll come back to that point in a minute. There's also uh, the work of this uh, gentleman uh, who is really um, Emery uh, Dayabanza, who is actually uh, from the Congo. And he's been walking into museums, and this, this happened around 20, uh, also 2020, maybe just a little after. He's been walking into museums in Europe, picking up sculptures that come from Africa and walking out with them. And, you know, people come up to him, like maybe not even guards, maybe just like some curator that's walking through the museum and saying, you know, well, where are you going with that? And he's meanwhile, of course, taping the thing with his co collaborators who are nearby and talking about how so much of the work has left Africa and has been stolen as now appears in, in museums, right? Um, is he an activist or is he an artist? Is he, this, this could certainly be a performance piece. There's no question that this could be a kind of institutional critique. He does not describe himself as artist. And yet the group decolonized this place, which has also now uh, morphed into uh, a strike MoMA, strike the Museum of Modern Art, uses him as an example of the kind of aesthetic critique or protest art that needs to take place at this time work from Poland, critiquing uh, the rollback of abortion rights in Poland, and more recently taking uh, work by constructivist artists from Ukraine and turning it into sort of street art to protest the war 
uh, that Russia is, is waging on Ukraine. And I'm going to just, let's see, show you one more thing. I'm going to pass over this in a second. Um, okay, now let's get back to a little bit of history. Um, 1960s, a group called Art Workers Coalition, an offshoot group called Guerrilla Art Action Group, or GAG, doing actions in the street to protest not just artists' working conditions, which is important to keep in mind. This also started artists, including Hans Hock and others, saying, you know, artists should be treated better, contemporary living artists, by museums and the art world. And asking for things like, um, we were talking about this before, why can't the museum deaccession some of the work it has of you know, dead artists, make a fund, put a fund together to have social security for living artists? You know, why are you treating contemporary artists almost like insignificant players in this sort of realm, right? But these concerns about artists' working conditions quickly sort of metamorphosed into critiques of the entire system, critiques of uh, using the museum as a platform to talk about the Vietnam War at the time, uh, issues around ecology, racism, feminism, and so forth. And again, what's interesting to me about this is the way it seems pretty unique, maybe it's completely unique to the art world, that we as artists, speaking as an artist now, ha feel we have the right to ask questions that go way beyond what would seem to be the purview of our training, our so-called professionalism, and what we are. Right? How did that come about? Like, how is it that artists don't feel that it's enough necessarily just to make uh, beautiful aesthetic paintings or objects, but when called upon, they can go far beyond that and raise an entire political critique? And what's intriguing, and I talk about this in the book, is you can look at a lot of the movements of artists in the 60s, 70s, and going forward, and you find artists coming to demonstrations who are doing all kinds of work, not just political work, not explicitly political work, not graphics about politics. People like Donald Judd and, and, and Robert Morris doing minimalist art, which you could, you know, maybe you can make an argument that that's a political uh, project, their work, that's another issue, but certainly not explicitly so that any person who doesn't know the art world would, would get it. Feeling that they could, as an artist, participate in this kind of critique. Uh, it's really hard to find another profession where that, and I don't know if there is another profession, if we want to call art a profession, um, where that takes place, right? So what is it that motivates this desire for, um, not only the desire for change, but the feeling that artists have a right to do that? This is work from that we carried out in the Lower East Side in the 1980s, using Picasso's Guernica imagery, street stencils, uh, on, you know, that were put up on various sides of buildings, but also on sidewalks, talking about artists coming to the rescue of people who are being displaced. Why? Well, I'm sure you all know, you know, at this point, how much culture is used to leverage the situation of gentrification. We were just sort of beginning to understand that link then. And let me just jump forward one more time. Oh, this is, of course, from England. You probably know the Edward Colston, uh, slave trader who got thrown in the water in Bristol. And this will be my last image, and, and I'm going to wrap up in a second so we can have a conversation. But this is from Ukraine, a group of artists in Kyiv uh, who are turning their sculptural capacity into producing what they sometimes call hedgehogs, which are these kind of barricades that uh, prevent tanks from rolling forward. And they, they're doing other kinds of work, too. Um, and of course, you can't help but look at this and think, OK, that is a minimalist sculpture, circa 1960. Uh, no, it's actually a, a tank barricade. Uh, no, it's a minimalist sculpture. No, it's a tank barricade. The question that I finally raise in the book, and that's why it's called The Art of Activism and the Activism of Art, is have we reached a point where these two seemingly separate, sometimes overlapping realms have actually sort of superimposed themselves uh, on each other in such a way that really is, it's almost irrelevant whether we look at it as art or whether we look at it as activism. And how is that possible? Is it because 
artists have finally dreamed of historical agency and sort of brought it about? Have they finally realized the dream of the avant-garde, which is to take art into the everyday world? I would say yes, except it's not artists who've done that. I'm going to put forward the possibility that the dream of the avant-garde, which is to bring art into the everyday world, including activism and politics, has taken place because capitalism has been so successful at incorporating avant-garde ideas into its own processes. And we now live in a world that's highly, highly aestheticized, highly sort of spectacularized. And if you remember what I said, like, keep an eye on these images, just the visual complexity of these images folds directly into a world in which everything is this set of size that we look at, right? Everything from catastrophes overseas to, to you know, shootings to sort of beautiful moments, cats dancing across the floor and so on and so forth. The internet, uh, but not just the internet, but everything has sort of like produced a highly, highly aesthetic world to the point we could say it's almost a kind of um, gigantic design project by capitalism that integrates us. And so in my sort of way of looking at this, the art of activism and the activism of art converge precisely in a world where it's possible for that to happen. It doesn't mean that we don't have some kind of political agency. It doesn't mean we're not haunted. And I end the book with the idea of hauntology, which I take from Jacques Derrida, which is to say that it's a kind of sense of the past. And I'm not using the word history here, but I'm talking about a kind of phantom archive of all kinds of possibilities. Uh, ruptures, successful sort of minor uh, successful stories like the one I showed you with the prison shut down, dead ends, failures, uh, even moments when it was not democratic processes that sort of triumphed, right? And we're seeing that a lot more today. But all of these things in this kind of surplus archive of possibilities seeps through like ghosts into the present. And it continues to sort of animate that question of, you know, what is it about art that drives it to constantly want to create change, move something forward, escape from the present, withdraw? All these are sort of options that uh, are on the table at the moment. So I'm going to leave it right there. Lots of little provocations, I hope. And I'm sure you guys have things that I'm going to learn about in detail. Thank you. So I'm interested in asking you how much of your work is connected to responding to situations and current events and incorporating that into the lexicon and theoretical framework that you've been developing. And how do you do that in terms of the process? And, and then I'd like to hear more from you around that idea that you left us at the end of your presentation, where this, uh, this kind of this um, ambition for the avant-garde to integrate art within the everyday and what do you feel what is current activists slash artists are currently doing in Ukraine matches that ambition. Yeah. Thank you. No, it's a great it's a great series of questions. Um, I think that given that it's about activist art, the, the, the writings that I do and research, um, it would be kind of impossible if I didn't have something to say about what's going on with the war in, in Ukraine, or before that in Syria, and you know so many other situations. Um, not that I can analyze it politically to the T, because it's not my area of expertise, um, but I do have uh, connections to people there uh, in, in Ukraine, and, and a project that I worked on with Austin, actually, here in Ireland, that went to Ukraine in 2014, and we, we did it um, just as the Maidan uprising just after the shootings on Maidan Square. There was sharpshooters killing people, probably almost certainly government-oriented. Um, and uh, we were kind of 
you know, questioning whether we should go. This is myself and Olga Karpankina, my uh, wife, and who's also a curator. And you know, we decided, okay, we're going to go because people there are really engaged with this project that we're doing, Imaginary Archive. And I'll just give you a quick sketch of what that is, um, which is we give people a kind of a question or a prompt or a challenge. So if we brought the, it here to say serious art gallery, you would probably identify maybe some artists or maybe the people coming to this, you know. And then we would ask them the following question, produce a document about a past whose future never arrived. Document about a past whose future never arrived. And the archive literally becomes made up of these impossible uh, objects, you know, documents, posters, printed materials, whatever, photographs. What's fascinating, we've done the show in Ukraine, Ireland, obviously, Germany, New Zealand, uh, Philadelphia, many different places, and people very seldomly go off into sort of a complete fantasy. They almost always come up with something that has a grounding in the actual history, right? So it was kind of really, that was really an interesting aspect of it. And the work from Ukraine was particularly poignant given that it was this moment of, really was a pivotal moment for I think what's happening now. Because of course Russia was taking Crimea at the same time, the people in Kyiv were trying to sort of move towards the European Union and you had this um, and the show itself, each time it's reinstalled, Imaginary Archive, it has a new form. And in that particular case, we literally borrowed materials off of Maidan, mostly tires, which were used for barricades, because they're easy to get, they're, they're, very, you know, they're very resistant to things, and also if you heat them up to a certain degree, they create these incredible sort of fires, you know, as torch fires. Um, so we took tires off with uh, an agreement with people on Maidan because they were holding the square still because they didn't know if Russia might actually come in. And we installed the archive in a nearby like alternative space, spread out the materials we, we had created and the new material from the people from Ukraine who had contributed about 11 artists. And then all of a sudden the, the lights went out, just pitch dark because it was also downstairs in a space. And it's like, what's happening? And so we got torches, you know, flashlights, we handed them out. And the opening basically starts with people walking around in the dark looking at these various imaginary, uh, you know, documents and objects and archive. And then someone went to Maidan Square again, which was just a couple blocks away, and scored some gasoline and came back and we put a, a you know, a sort of generator on with the lights. So that was, that was our experience in, in, in Ukraine. Um, so the, I, I feel like there is at least some sense of a connection to, to that part of the world. So my wife was born in the Soviet Union and grew up in uh, Belarus. Uh, but I don't pretend to have any sort of super special, uh, you know, knowledge, except to say that you know some of the things that we deal with, both politically and in terms of culturally, can I think relate to what's happening in these kind of pivotal situations, and um, you know, hopefully, the the book ends a little bit by talking about Ukraine. Hopefully, it. Some of the things I raised around this idea of a, a sort of an archive as opposed to a history. The question of repetition, um, which I think is very important in the next book I'm going to work on, that's going to be very important, as opposed to sort of like revolution, as opposed to like wiping the, the slate clean, which is kind of one idea of revolution, but actually revolution is a kind of repetition of, you know, what's happening, right? Um, and you see this maybe with uh, the Russian, the Kremlin's desire to kind of reinstate a sort of pre, I would say pre-revolutionary empire, you know, Tsarist empire, as opposed to uh, certainly the Soviet empire, which I think was something else. Not that they're not, there's not a link, especially with Stalinism, but I really feel like this is kind of going back to pre-World War I, what's happening now, you know, politically. But that's another discussion. But in terms of the cultural and artistic question, uh, yeah, the workers and the, the artists who are creating barricades and other kinds of projects, I find it really just fascinating um, that they immediately sort of begin to take the tools and the skills they have and put them into some kind of a practice in terms of a defense system or whatever it is. Um, where does that where does that knowledge come from? How is it being applied? You know, I think I think it's really interesting how we also interpret it. 
because as I said, it's hard not to look at those things and think about minimalist art or sculpture or Anthony Caro maybe, whatever. Our, our heads start to sort of, as art people, right, we start to sort of create these links. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily frivolous. I think that these things have become part of the cultural uh, aesthetic or the sort of tissue of what we live in. So um, I don't know if that's an answer or just a, uh, a sort of elaboration. But in terms of the avant-garde, maybe that's a question that we could actually have uh, more of a discussion with around, because I actually don't use the term avant-garde in this book. I try to avoid it until maybe the very end of the book, and then I bring it back in as a, as a question mark. And I think a lot of people would say, you're talking about activist art, and you think about the history of the avant-garde from Dadaism to surrealism, I mean, and certainly the Russian, uh, you know, and Ukrainian and Belarusian sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, forms of post-revolutionary art. How do you not discuss the avant-garde in terms of activist art? And I purposely pull back and try to hold off that question, you know, for various reasons, because I think it's, yeah, anyway, we could talk about that. So, other questions, other comments? Yeah, please. So I think there's a simple question just the first day. Um, when I think about what you presented today and then I think about what's in the final chapter, um, it, it makes me ask, and you can decide how to answer this over the next week, but there's this question of kind of optimism or pessimism about, uh, about our activism. Um, and so clearly, there's a thing called art activism, and it's already happening. So that's that's descriptive at some point. But um, there's so many sort of posthumanist uh, references in the last chapter that makes you really question, I suppose, the naivete even sometimes of the kinds of people and the kinds of institutions, the, the, the cultural momentum that is carried forward in art activism. Mm -hmm. And and yet, I don't want to be despairing about a situation either. Um, I, you mentioned Giorgio Agamben. Um, I, I, I hate how right he is about things um, because it's very, it's a very depressing position. So I don't know. You, you cheered him more at the beginning of like, gosh, look at these people doing these great things. Let's let's do more of those great things. And then at the end, you ask these questions. You know, like, has this actually already been entirely swallowed by by capitalism? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want a, a capsule answer to that, or you just want to stretch it out for the week. But I don't have a capsule it answer. Right out. It's, yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and it's a good point. Um, and, and I described, you know, the trajectory of how the book came about. So you can imagine over the course of a couple of years, you know, um, trying to sort of work through this material, getting to the last bit, and having a different, maybe a somewhat different perspective, or hmm, a sort of perspective that kind of percolated and became maybe more fertilized or sort of fermented uh, by the time you get done. Um, but yeah, I think, I, I hope that it doesn't come off as totally negative or pessimistic. I hope not, because it really wasn't the intention. It, it was to sort of be um, uh, kind of clear, I guess, in my mind about like, okay, here's the stakes, here's the situation. And maybe, again, coming back to Martha's kind of enigmatic, but maybe not so enigmatic, I mean, pretty obvious kind of like comment about the desire for some kind, of, some kind of total emancipation, that 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 haunts, it seems to me, even the moment in which things seem to be completely swallowed, as you put it. Um, I don't think you can, I don't think you can get away from that haunting, and I think that's, I hope what I posited at the very end is that possibility, right? So even though I'm not trying to talk about the avant-garde in, in its classic sense, is that, can you even say that about the avant-garde? Not really, I guess. But you know what I mean. Um, I guess, yeah, I'm pulling my punches a little bit, suggesting that, but you know, ultimately, this desire is still there. You know, it, hasn't, it doesn't evaporate, right? I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, I don't think I have a better take on it at this point. And maybe 10 years from now, people will. But, yeah. So, um, I was just looking at this idea of options and pessimism, um, and also going back to when you're talking about the imaginary and what it means to stage um, impossible examples. I guess you do talk about um, utopian perspectives 
Um, and I just wonder how far um, does this idea of um, uh, staging impos- of impossibilities, how far does that enact change? And I guess this also leads to the question of um, how, um, what role do, can art take and is it necessarily needed within activism? Which is, I think is something that you pick mm-hmm. up on. The, uh, can you frame this in terms of like a question, maybe in relationship to a particular example? That would be interesting. Yeah, no, I think it's. Um, I mean, it, there's one at one stage in the book where you were talking about this idea of how art looks um, beyond this idea of representation as a means of um, moving towards this idea of um, agitation and protest as a medium. So I guess it's really just this idea of, um, you know, um, if art is not no longer um, seen as representing or um, imagining um, something else, then um, or kind of mirroring reality, in what way can it move actually um, into the real and produce a kind of um, change? Mm -hmm. And um, mm, the is it necessarily needed, you know, the visual aspects, is that necessarily needed within activism? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a great it's a great observation. And I think this is maybe this is something to thrash out over the course of the next few days with everyone. Um, because we do think of art of course as representational, first and foremost. Um, but there is obviously a point at which art can also constitute things or be, you know, actually embody or uh, create situations and even institutions and you know you're talking your your interesting response to what does activist art mean was immediately went there you know and I think that um, that is definitely something that we're all sort of experiencing at this point and I think many people would probably look at you know the even the art in in these three galleries and think well this how what does this have to do with art in a traditional sense You know, uh, it's a completely different kind of experience. It's not really representational necessarily. So I think it's kind of across the board, contemporary art, Mm -hmm. that it plays in these registers. I don't think it completely has abandoned the representational, Mm -hmm. but I think you're absolutely right that it, 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 there's a suspicion of the purely representational maybe in some cases, or an absolutely a desire to go beyond it, you know, or get out from under it, you know. So yeah, that's a really. I think that's a really interesting question that we should we should examine and think about. You know. And just, and just yeah, building on that. So, um, so instead of possibly looking at representation, um, people like Boris Boris talk about how um, art activism. Um, one of its characteristics is um, being a kind of art virus, and it seems like you know, kind of responding to the current condition and after the pandemic. Um, I guess. My question is, um, what is the role of the virus within art activism? Because it not only seems to be a characteristic of um, it, um, but also seems to be um, part of its content as well. Um, a lot of our activism seems to be responding to, you know, the pandemic or um, responding to the HIV crisis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the virus as a, as a kind of metaphor for, or memes even spreading virally, right? I mean, this has become like very commonplace in the way we talk about these things. It's interesting to, to such a degree. We can go back to, to William Burroughs talking about language as a virus, you know. It's not like it's particular to this, to this moment. Uh, but coming out of the COVID situation, you can't help but be struck by, by this metaphor. Like, what does it mean? How does it work? And it is interesting to think about sort of the digital networking world and sort of the viral world, uh, like the actual viral world, and the ways that they kind of uh, relate to each other. I don't know how else to put it, right? Um, Is that because we now think of things digitally and network-wise, and then we sort of inevitably, you know, sort of project that onto the natural world? Or is there actually perhaps some sort of more common relationship. I don't know. That's a, maybe you're in a better position to answer that than, than I am, given your research. You know, I mean, what would you what would you say to that question that you raised? Um, well, I think it's, I think it's um, kind of I 
I think possibly it's interesting looking at, um, I mean, I'm looking a lot at um, this idea of molecular politics and kind of looking at the um, microscopic scale in terms of how um, contemporary art practices that seems to be an emergence of um, art practices uh, turning molecular agency into sensible terms. Um, but I think it's um, possibly interesting looking at your, some of your previous work, which we're going to look at um, tomorrow, including dark matter, and how you um, um, seem to stage um, this idea of the invisible um, through um, as being particularly relevant to art activism, and you do that by looking at um, this idea of, um, I guess, you know, physical matter. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, it's an interesting point. I mean, the whole question of. Uh, so, so also the fact that viruses are basically what they're not even really alive, right? Mm-hmm. So they're completely dependent on uh, other kinds of organisms to reproduce, which but they don't actually sustain themselves outside of that that relationship. And they're not they're not all uh, dangerous, right? I mean, actually, most viruses are benign for the most part to humans and probably play a substantial role in uh, evolutionary process by exchanging DNA over time, right? It's sort of fascinating. Uh, It's just those now and then they wipe out enormous numbers of people. Um, So this idea of invisibility I think is kind of is kind of interesting. You know, my metaphor comes from physics for dark matter, which we'll talk about, I guess. But, you know, you could also imagine a biological sort of version of it, I suppose, you know. Yeah. But we think we think of sort of the biological having, I guess, an intentionality that we don't necessarily give to physics, although that seems to be changing as well. You know, so the idea of like you know the expansion of the universe is a physical force. Dark matter is what prevents it from expanding into like cold nothingness. But oops, nobody knows what dark matter is. You know, it's kind of like uh, coming up with a you know, a, a fantasy of what might be there, which happens to be most of what's there, t- in order to fix the problem in a theory, which is kind of intriguing. Uh, but we don't think of it as having any kind of intentionality, right? Uh, and yet, with, with sort of the viral world, at least there seems to be some motivation to reproduce, if not actually to sort of, yeah, you know, challenge other forms of life. So it's interesting how we kind of play with those metaphors I know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, one, I have one straightforward question and then a few other just observations related to it. Um, one, you said about that you, um, that artists seem to um, have confidence in speaking outside their own areas and that they're, um, they're more engaged maybe in activism than people from other fields. But is that just your impression, or have you did um, have you actually done stats on that? No, I haven't done any quantitative work on it. I would I would find that I would like to try to do that. I think just enough to sort of feel more confident, but. Um, but just observationally, you know, I would say, you know, I mean, of course, you know, doctors might uh, gather the Doctors Without Borders uh, is an interesting organization, um, but they're not necessarily critiquing their own field of medicine. I mean, they might critique it institutionally, but they don't necessarily sort of fundamentally say that, you know, medicine is about the idea of critiquing society. They're applying, I, this is my interpretation, they're applying uh, their skill set to try to make a positive change in the world. Whereas artists feel that somehow, I mean, this is a question I'd like to really hear from everybody actually, is artists sort of feel like it's, it's their inherited right to basically go beyond just making pictures and to actually, you know, question the world, right? I mean, go all the way back to Plato's, you know, desire to keep artists out of the Republic and see certain anxieties around this notion. And there we're, we are talking about representation, right? The, 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 the danger of representation, right? And, and, and the better the representation, the more dangerous, maybe. So. Yeah, yeah no, and uh, I'd actually, like I said, if you're, if you're, um, 
if your guess around it is correct, I'd actually have my own speculation. It's kind of in contemporary art or if you're going through art um, education or anything. Okay. I think it's almost like you can be an amateur at everything. If you're a contemporary artist, you can use it then as your art practice. You right. may not make money on it or anything, but yeah, you can. So I think that may give people this wider, um, you know, thing that they actually feel they can come. Like you could be a you could be a soccer player in your art practice, mm -hmm. unless you're really skilled and talented and do a huge amount of training, etc. You're never going to be a soccer player in the real world at an right. elite level. But when you're talking about representation, I think um, it reminds me of, I think it's Hito Styler's essay, The Politics of Representation versus the rep Representation of Politics. Yeah. And it does a very clear, um, clear kind of going through from the professionalization of say art in America from the late 60s but also how the, the more vi visible people become often minorities etc in the field actually the actual political representation and the actual conditions of life is actually getting worse so you have the image on the top of things getting better but actually yeah. When you kind of go into things like pay, housing, etc., it's all getting worse. So yeah. there's a very interesting, you know, thing yeah. between those two things. Yeah, sort of dialectic there. I mean, I, I have to reread that piece because I haven't read it in a while, but it's, it's a great suggestion, Hito, Hito style. Maybe we can put, put that on our. Is there a way we could like, put things that people suggest somewhere and that people yeah. could access them? You know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Right, but just just to grab it, you know. Um, but I think it, it's a really interesting point. I mean, I, in my teaching, I would often talk about, um, let's say, this would be yeah, maybe 20 years ago, in teaching in the Art Institute. I was teaching arts administration at the time. And it was mostly women, which is kind of true now for the Master of Arts and social practice and everything, but it was young women, all of whom wanted to go into arts admin on some level, whether it was like at a museum level or starting a not-for-profit or whatever. And of course, we got around to the question of women, um, women's sort of you know, representation uh, in the sense of like how many women are actually there in the arts administration field. And you look around and everyone's a woman and it's like, okay, that's probably pretty good. And then the Gorilla Girls have done such a great job, you know, raising all these issues. And I said, oh, you know, you're, you're all right, you're all right. But listen, for next week's class, I want you to go and find out how many women are actually on the boards of directors and how many people are actually, how many women are directors and how many people are in those positions of power. And then they would come back, you know, the next week and they'd all be, oh, well, it's not so good, you know. So it kind of plays to what you were saying is this idea that on the one hand, the visibility seems to be improving. On the other hand, it doesn't mean necessarily things are getting better. They may even be getting kind of worse structurally. But again, this is, this is more of an impression than hard quantified data, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's a good point, though. Yeah. Did you have another part of your? Okay, yeah. Yeah, please. Um, I was, I guess, going back to the idea of artists who see themselves as artists, whatever that means, having the right to ask questions that other people don't ask. ask. And I mean, I've struggled with that all my life as an artist. And then partly because the right very easily slips into duty, whether actually we very broadly as a bunch of people who in all kinds of ways have um, allocated ourselves a role that's potentially so rich and so rewarding and so, I mean I, I often think of talking with people who aren't, uh, I've just done some work with some kids and we talked about this a lot. Um, what is it being, what is art, what is it to be an artist? And I just, we just talked around, just that one thing, for instance, of um, being able to be, well, having to be, feeling totally enmeshed in something. So, I mean, uh, doing this work, so, I mean, I suppose, in my life, that's been illustrated very dramatically for me 
by having a totally unsuitable building for, for a studio for years and realizing after working for five, five hours on a particular day um, that the temperature was probably not zero, but close to <laughs> I was very stiff. And how many people, I mean, I can sound great, but it is great to me. And how many people um, create a life for themselves where that's the norm? So there's this thing of, of paying back that I feel, and that's where a lot of my work that's been, as I said, in, uh, slightly or overtly political. Um, and the other thing, the way, when you use the word naive, I, I, felt, I felt it was slightly dismissive of the word, I don't know if that's right, but then I, I kind of felt uh, protective of the word naive, and I think one's naivety, in some respects, is, is one of those gifts to be able to be, to, to be able to see things in black and white. To some respect. I mean, obviously, it's very important, deeply important, that not everybody does, and maybe not all artists, but um, it's, been, it's been a big part of my life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, I would stand up for naivety. Okay. All right. Who else wants, who else wants to stand up for naivety? Okay. All right. Uh, the, the naive art front we can create. You know, uh, the NAF. Um, no, I agree with that. Did I use the word NAFT or was it? I don't usually use that. It was you, right? I think, yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I mean, it, there's a, yeah, I mean, I absolutely think there is kind of an advantage to, yeah, also, uh, naive might not be the right way to put it, but sort of basically to not overly analyze and, and to, to just get down to it, right, and to do it. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not dismissing that at all. There's a whole chapter in the book um, where I try to introduce, like, non-art world art, let's say, art from movement, what I call sort of social movement culture. It's not my terminology, but, you know, the idea that people who either teach themselves how to make cultural expressions as part of a, a social movement, let's say, anti-nuclear movement or something in the 1980s, or maybe artists who were sort of trained in the academy or something, but then they kind of left any attempt to be part of the so-called art world and to work with the social movement. Again, let's say the anti-nuclear movement. So I try to sort of bring that whole sphere, which is really huge actually, into the context of the book, which primarily talks about more, you know, art world known phenomena and to sort of, I don't mesh it perfectly, but I certainly try to raise the question where those two things connect, right? Um, and of, of course, you, you look at people who are just doing like, you know, right on posters and you think, oh, that's, you know, moving but naive, you know, like obviously it's more complex. Uh, but I think, you know, on a certain level, that kind of work has uh, absolute significant legitimacy uh, in, its, in, its, in its context of social movements in a way that I think a lot of highly trained visual artists wish they could get to, you know, like I wish I could, could, could get to that point. Um, I wish I could abandon this sort of seeming edict that I have to be ironic if I'm going to do something that's really sort of directly political, right? Uh, and yeah, I think, this is the, I think this is the moment though actually where that's really become important discussion, you know, or, or, or a very visible discussion, let's put it that way. A lot of younger artists seem to, to be, from what I'm gathering, you know, seeing people's work, just sort of no longer sort of sweating those differences so much and moving between different kinds of registers of not just medium, you know, people doing video and then suddenly painting, but sort of not being so sort of like self-conscious that, well, if I'm going to make a political statement, it also, you know, has to have this kind of level of aesthetic sophistication or formal sophistication or ironic uh, underbelly, you know, so that you can kind of... I don't know if you know the work of Rudolf Baranek. He was a painter. His work should be, should be better known maybe for a lot of reasons, but he was a, he was a painter coming out of the 50s uh, and, of course, very influenced by abstract expressionism. 
and at a certain point he tried to make um, what he called uh, as, as, he called it sort of um, political formalism. This was his uh, Baranek, B-A-R-A-N-I-C-K or B-A-R-A-N-I-K maybe at the end, Baranek. Um, Lithuanian, I think, uh, artist. If, and um, so this idea of sort of, uh, sort of political formalism was this paintings that if you look at them initially, you'll think that they were kind of abstract expressionist in mode. And then as you look closer, you realize he's using imagery of like children being burned by napalm in Vietnam and, you know, very disturbing kind of elements that are moving through the, through the work. Um, and it's an interesting example of someone who I think, on the one hand, you know, was looking at, now we're talking at the post-war period in America, at the sort of the dominance of abstract expressionism and people like Clement Greenberg and critics like that and the power they had. And, and on the other hand, wanting to sort of get to it, let's say it's called a naive, whatever you want to call it, like a direct political position. And it's, it, to me, it's interesting to see that sort of like almost divide that comes together in his work. I don't know if the work is successful, I can't really say, but it is interesting to see that intersection there. Um, so yeah, I talk a lot about that in the book too, about the power that formalism and Greenbergianism, uh, and not Greenberg is just a good example of a lot of writers from that period after the war. Um, also the anti-figurative aspect of it and how strong that was and artists sort of trying to figure out how they could make a political art, but they didn't want to completely sort of disavow, right, the sort of sophisticated art discourse or ideas. And, and it's just, to me, it's very interesting tension. That, yeah. I mean, I think conceptual art, I'd be interested to hear what, how you bring conceptual art into this kind of question of materialism, but it was also an attempt uh, for me, like if you think about it, it, it was it overtly anti-Greenbergian, and yet you could sort of take a step back and say, well, but wait a minute, is is this really, you know, uh, so so different, you know, in its in its approach, right? Um, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, quite different strands. But if you look at Kasu's work, yeah. it sort of does. It becomes a formalism at a higher level, you know. Again, I mean, uh, but there's a lot of there's a lot of activism even of those more formal uh, conceptual artists which was sort of lost. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, like, Kasuj was actually like an arts editor in this political journal at uh, one stage that was doing. Anti-capitalism? Uh, it was like, it was one called Marxist Perspective, like it was like oh, a, a high, uh, uh, like a, you know, a lot of theoretical debates, but I haven't been able to access those, but it's mm -hmm. just interesting, there was also things a lot of them around, as you say, like the, the AWC, the Art Workers Coalition, which um, was, yeah, was a very interesting version of it. Somebody who, um, yeah, to go on the pessimism side, like, I think people got a certain, there are people got pessimistic in the 60s and 70s. I really like, like Ian Burns' writings, um, but he's somebody who took the position of just exiting, and he just did trade union work then afterwards. Um, yeah. And not just around the Astro, but generally just in mm -hmm. uh, trade unions. Um, whereas nowadays, I, it, it's funny, like what you presented, it, it definitely isn't an exit uh, that people are doing, you know? That, um, yeah, I, I, have, I have sympathy for the notions that things are sort of melding for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but then actually, I, I do have a question about that one. Is it, um, yeah, in what degree when you write about activist art, do you need to explain it from like an art archive rather than, well, what's going on in other spheres, you know, that was it, um, was it strikes by, you know, teachers in America or something that influenced others to get unionized, you know, where did, where did it trend towards uh, that political activity or union unionizing is actually effective? It, it might have been the, the outside of our things that influenced it within the art sphere, you know? Mm -hmm. um, which, yeah, which I think is, is interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll work on some, some other points around conceptualism when I come back uh, later on in the week. Because, okay, uh, yeah, yeah the, my particular interest in materialism is. It, it, it was around the, 
the concept and material, what they're using concepts as materials. So it's sort of a, a riff on that. How is that? How is that confused? How we have to think about materialism? Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You go right to art and language. Uh, you know, I think that's an interesting cluster of people because obviously Kazuth was part of the American branch that you know had a rather contentious I would say mostly relationship with the British group and then there were people uh, Eve Byrne who ultimately went back to Australia I guess he was from Australia originally yeah. uh, um, had a tragic death as you probably know but very interesting writer I think he was maybe the first to use the concept of de-skilling in art if I'm not mistaken yeah yeah, yeah. And that kind of plays into what we're talking about a bit too, this idea of artists abandoning the traditional skill sets of you know, painting, representation, et cetera, um, which opens out onto this question of, well, then can community organizing be art and can you know, anything really, I mean, as you put it, the art, uh, it's, you, know, you can't help not bring in Duchamp's ready-made at that point and say, okay, did that open this kind of Pandora's box of possibilities, right? Um, or was art already in some way ontologically, if you will, like what its very being is already kind of like questioned or it doesn't actually have an ontology, maybe, you know, it's just like it's kind of reframed at each gesture uh, or at each, each historical moment, let's say. Uh, but there's no question that Today, yeah, you're right. You could be like a, a really lousy soccer player and be an artist, a very successful artist. You know, uh, so it, it's 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 to me it's a fascinating you know question. And when it comes to activist art, then you end up you know basically you could be a really bad maybe activist, but a really interesting artist. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I think I, I want to raise another issue for the week, um, maybe lashing onto the questions about about the name and also maybe questioning what other kinds of exits are available, mm -hmm. um, or really the whole question of exits. And so first, about the naive, I would say there's, there's the really naive before we have the word naive, or the awareness of being naive. And then once we have that word and we choose to be naive, that's, it's still a naive, but it's the second kind of naive. So just mention that, that but where I'm really headed is when is depoliticizing something actually the ultimate political position to take? Um, and so everyone wants to react to the situation. But so you, you mentioned a word like de-stealing. When do we get to opt out? When do we get to uh, be refusing? You know, when do we? Uh, what, what does what does the claim for peace actually? look like, you know, and so I think of Seamus Haney refusing to write war poems, poems and yet he sustains something else through that whole time period. Uh, I, I'm the last person to be an expert of that in this room, but uh, that, that really touched me from afar, and, and, um, and it's not just, you know, did he survive as a classic poet and famous poets, like, what did he actually carry through? For Ireland through that whole period, and and so wasn't that the ultimate political position for him to take? Mm -hmm. When do we get to to actually refuse war rather than find the right side and get involved with it? Mm. Mm. Uh, I'm stop there. But yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, mean, I don't I don't have an answer. I, I just though, in your first com part of your comment, just to say that uh, it seems like artists have have often wanted to be naive. That that's a that's a continually re. Uh, appearing theme in art, at least since the 19th century, if not earlier, right? So even some of the earliest avant-garde in late 19th century, it was about let's go back to making, you know, like a kind of peasant art. And you know, you see in Russia too, you see this with before the revolution, Cobra. I mean, there's lots and lots of examples. We're going to make art like children, surrealism. We're going to do autumn, you know, as if you could shed the artifice of being an artist and therefore get back to something more fundamental and genuine and, uh, you know, you can call it naive if you want, whatever, but art without artifice. And yet, as you say, if you're doing it in that sense of shedding something, you're almost inevitably doing it almost to the second degree, right? Yeah. I would just connect the two things by saying that 
the pitch for peace is naive, and we know it's naive, and it's the best thing to do anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah. yeah. It's very, yeah, I've been trying to articulate into a question, but it's something because I felt very kind of outside of this conversation because I guess um, not being an artist, I'm specifically interested in art as a political tool and not as representational, but are necessarily representational because it can be very useful that way, but as part of a process of sustainable social change. And that's really my focus on it. So I don't, I suppose I don't get bogged down with, or I'm not burdened, personally burdened by broader arguments around whether something constitutes art or not. I don't particularly care myself. As I said, I come from this very specific field, and that's not to dismiss everything. It's just I'm trying to explain my perspective in this. Um, So I suppose my question keeps changing. and then kind of coming back to the same place. Um, first of all, when you talk about like that artists and activism, for me it's very difficult to, to have this only framed within that kind of, um, I suppose, identification. Um, for me, okay, so artists would be, you know, you can have um, rich, successful artists, capitalist artists, right-wing artists, left you know what I mean? You can have activists who are artists. So for me, just uh, this blanket term of an ident- you know, we're all holistic social beings, we're all many, many things. Um, so even to try and kind of frame the, art, the, the conversation we're having now in, in these kind of terms is difficult for me. So I suppose my question is that when obviously there have been great kind of victories, let's say, the one that you showed as well, you know, of the museum and art workers. So art can kind of gain these victories. Um, But I suppose my question is, is it not inevitable that they'll just be absorbed unless there's also a coexisting process of reinstitution? Um, And in order for that to happen, the artist has to be something beyond an artist. It has to be the person has to, or the artist has to be um, a long-term social activist has to be, underst- you know, politically aware, and have to have a broader idea beyond that action. You know, or as for me, it's inevitable. I mean, that's quite pessimistic. But, but I'm actually, I, I don't. For me, I work only within kind of longer-term thinking of um, trying to create um, kind of artistic projects, collaborative projects that can, you know, can have kind of the idea of sustainability at the centre of them. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, I'm just, I suppose my question is, um, can it, uh, I'm trying to, trying to find a way of saying it that doesn't sound really blunt. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it, okay, so is it inevitable that it'll only ever be kind of these victories which are, can be life-changing for people, mm-hmm. but won't actually change, you know, the systems that uh, they'll be absorbed back into the systems. I suppose that's why I'm quite cynical when I see the Tate doing something or whatever, because it's always in the first interest of the Tate and anything else after. So, yeah, I'm just wondering what you think. <laughs> just open that up as well. Yeah, it's certainly the million-dollar question, I guess you could say. I mean, it's, it's complex uh, in some ways and very straightforward in others. Um, my position, I mean, this is only speaking for myself, is I don't think artists uh, are the ones who actually bring about real social change. You know, I don't think that's possible. I think that artists uh, are an expression of political uh, interests or movements or ideas. Uh, and insofar as they're part of some larger movement, maybe something happens, you know. Um, it's not to say that artists don't sometimes, yeah, uh, open up a door to something that maybe wasn't as mm-hmm. clarified be- as it was. Well, I do think it's yeah. powerful. Yeah, yeah, but I don't think artists by, I don't think art itself, let's say, uh, or the, the aesthetic realm itself can actually bring about, um, you know, long-term political change without yeah. political change. Yeah, the way I see it is through process again. Um, art can create um, shared collective language that goes beyond mm-hmm. education, it goes beyond those mm-hmm. other kind of, you know, 
social disadvantages. Yeah. So it can really, really work in those, you know, it's been creating kind of a shared language, um, giving people voice. I mean, I can't think of anything that's more successful than kind of these uh, embedded creative processes within kind of collective learning, collective action. Um, so I'm kind of thinking of it in, in those right. terms as well. I find it hugely powerful yeah. um, and important. In my sort of sense of, of experience of the art sort of world, so to speak, um, people who've kind of worked in the realm of direct community engagement, let's say, uh, for many, many decades, you know, have tended to sort of turn their back on the art world, you know, the kind of, that work like the Kazuth the art world, the, the conceptual, uh, whatever this is, right, that we, and we can maybe try to define that over the course of the next couple of days, um, turn their back on it, and the art world has been completely happy about the fact that they would turn their back on it, because they haven't had any interest in, in this kind of work until very, very recently, you know. And now suddenly uh, they're very interested, at least it seems, in sort of socially engaged art. And I use this term not for, not talking about activist art per se, because I find that's more of a militant position, but not that it's absolutely crisp, clear division. But um, so yeah, we have all these major museums and doing work in the communities and doing, you know, let's do a socially engaged art project. First of all, it's great because, you know, the costs are relatively cheap compared to, like, having to commission, like, an artwork that then has to be sort of maintained, maybe, you know, has to find a home in a museum. I mean, or, no, it's ephemeral. People go, they, you know, get their post-it notes out, they do something, and then they're gone, and it's all great. The community, everybody feels good. This is, this is a relatively low-hanging fruit, as people like to say, to sort of, you know, um, but, you know, it's interesting that some of the people who've been working in community-based art that I know for many, many decades, right, are like just as angry about socially engaged art because they say, well, we've been doing this, you know, for a really long time. And now all of a sudden people coming out of art schools, etc., are doing it. Um, but, you know, we've just been completely sort of sidelined yet again, you know. Not only did the old art world think we weren't cool enough or not smart enough or not ironic enough or whatever, or we didn't understand aesthetics or whatever, um, now it's like now they're embracing what, almost the same thing we're doing, but it's, we're still not part of it, right? So there's a lot of kind of... I think it's really important to be having these conversations now, and particularly in Ireland, as you know, um, it's really being pushed through policy. Mm -hmm. um, so now, if you're going for arts, Irish art, like arts funding in Ireland, there's a big emphasis on it being, you know, inclusive. All the things that it should be, but there's something very boring about the way it's being pushed through. Mm -hmm. In that, for somebody who, um, so I would have artists contacting me to tick a box, basically, in an application form and calling it socially engaged art. So, and I'm not. That's very cynical, but this is the the. The worry there, you know what I mean, and um, that, yeah, now it's the time to be kind it's, of... It's the, it's the new uh, demand, the new, the new normal, yeah. But again, I suppose I'm seeing similarities in what you're talking about, the people, you know, your friends or whatever, who've been doing this for years, in that when it again becomes so often, in a way, and then translation into policy, and, you know, and then within the kind of competitive world, social engaged art is as competitive as any other yeah. branch of our practice, mm -hmm. and... Yeah, then it becomes yeah, something else. I mean, one of the things I tr I've been trying to point to through this book and other things is to sort of say, though, this um, focus on the social has become uh, pretty ubiquitous. I mean, it's kind, of, it's kind of an eruption into whatever the art world thought it was before that I don't think is reversible at this point. You know, I think this is this is the the situation. You know, I can't imagine going back to the days when someone would do a monochromatic painting and you'd be talking about, you know, the, the particular shade of blue and the sh and the sort of texture of it. You know, now you would talk about, well, this is the you know the way the sky looked over Tahrir Square during the Re Egyptian Revolution. You know, it's exactly the same painting. It's just now we're framing it, you know, in a in a different way. And I don't think you can get. I don't see a way that you can undo that discourse that's now kind of like everywhere, right? So that's that's a reality. Like you know, coming back to your point, it's like, well, let's look coolly and coldly at what is, and not try to pretend 
you know, we, we, this sucks, okay, maybe, but like, okay, this is, right? So how do we go from here? And, and then I guess the bigger question, you know, you're raising is like, well, is it enough to have like the success that Laurie Joe had with the, the prison, which is terrific, it's amazing, right? Let's say we had dozens of these in different kind of areas that we could talk, to, talk about, but is that sufficient really to bring about the kind of social change that I think we really want that will use the term sustainable, whatever, but that's just that it doesn't roll back, you know, to the same degree. And I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure we have that kind of vision anymore. I mean, this is this is something that people can really criticize me for, but I, I I'm not saying I think it was certainly not the right approach was to have the concept of the master narrative, which people work so hard to deconstruct and get rid of, whether that's the revolution or you know the proletariat or whatever but there's something that's also been lost in the process that and we don't have like a replacement for it so we have many possibilities for social change here 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 and here and here and here but what's sort of missing and this is the ghost that I talk about at the end is this idea of the total emancipation so I start the book really after the introduction with the situationists you know because they're Sort of, sort of fundamental to some of these ideas. It seems to me, uh, both in terms of the question of the spectacle, the spectacularization of capitalism, but they certainly believed, at least my reading of what they did is uh, in the possibility of a complete transformation, like a cure for the spectacle, and that takes place through the liberation of creativity, through artistic practices that they invented, like the detournement and these other ideas, you know. Um, but they didn't give up on the idea of like a total tr change, you know. Uh, and I think that's what's now we don't have anymore. We don't have the concept of total change, you know. Um, and maybe that's just, yeah, I don't know. I'd be curious to see what people think of that. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. I just listened to a podcast um, interview last night with Jodie and actually she's discussing, I don't know if it's a new article or what she's doing, but like the, you know, I'm sure you've heard the kind of idea that of techno feudalism, you know, so, and that's very much, she would say, essentially, you know, it's an idea that actually we, contemporary society has gone, isn't really capitalist anymore, but it's actually much worse. And she kind of links it, she's, what she's saying as well as an idea of thinking about it that actually that this is an idea even if it's not a conscious thing or there's not a name on it within society that actually people are afraid what's the change will be worse whatever happens so you know they want a, a project of emancipation a idea that things could be better for you know, as a total global project, you know, you're talking about the um, master narrative, sure. the meta narrative, the Marxists essentially. And, um, but yeah, that's now gone. So, yeah, essentially. So, and actually, the kind of fear is that what else is going to yeah. come will be worse. And then there's also all, you know, basically any kind of thing that's considered, uh, you know, a, a big idea is also a potentially very, very dangerous thing to implement. So there's all this other stuff. And I think that kind of thing around techno-feudalism, I mean, I think for sure we are in, we actually are entering a different era. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things when you're talking about art activism, I think maybe if you think, say, we were in the period of art for art's sake, say, from, I don't know, from the last, say, the 19th century through, that that's actually, I think that's actually gone. And maybe so if you think of art as previously being part of religion and previous to that being part of ritual. So maybe actually that's a kind of speculative idea around activism art. Maybe that's it, that there, it's the kind of, the tendency of the future, it, that will kind of disappear, but that's the kind of disappearance. Now it's gone into, that aspect is going into being useful, you know, art for art's sake, it's a major thing, it was, it was yeah. useless, it didn't have a purpose, it 
wasn't propaganda, it couldn't be right if it was propaganda, if it had a purpose, you know. So that maybe that's actually contained within it. And of course the other thing of that is actually that it has dissolved anyway, because everything is aestheticized. Everything is, um, so much of the whole world is about visualization, making a visualization. And also then when you get into the actual technology, it's so reductive because unless it can be actually counted in some way, you can't, you know, it doesn't count. You know, that sounds kind of, but like that, it's all about data and information. It's not about anything else, so the, the material carrier or everything is like, so if you can't count it, you can't do it. That's what's happening to the humanities, essentially. It's being, you, say, digital humanities would be a very good example. I think it's the humanities trying to save itself from being totally called off. You know, they're basically joining in with computing. Mm -hmm. In the colleges now you get, like, computing psychology, computing this, computing that, because basically it's just a way of getting rid of all of the useless subjects like classics, humanities, every, everything. So everything has to be for, you know, a job of some kind or some money to be made. So, so that's probably pretty pessimistic. <laughs> that's pretty pessimistic, yeah. So, what writer did you start with? Huh? Which writers? Jody Dean. Jody Dean. She's J an American. J O D I D E A N. Jody Dean. She does stuff in psychology. Yeah. And very interesting writing around the internet and yeah. um, communicative capitalism. I think she may have come up with the phrase. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. No, I think Dean has got some really good, uh, you know, some really good ideas. Absolutely, she's definitely worth reading and being aware of. Um, yeah, but. This idea of um, the disappearance of the big idea is intriguing and problematic, and I'm sure she's one who probably finds it very, very troubling. You know, as a more of a, a, some ways, a, a, that's not really fair, but more of a mainstream Marxist in some ways, still in a certain way. You know, yeah, yeah. But as an inverse to that, is there also the possibility for you like, know you've got um, arts artists and as individuals and as groups, uh, I guess kind of biting the hands that feed them, you know, when you're going to go up against the matter, you're going to go up against the Guggenheim, you know, they're the things that we are bred notionally to aspire towards, so that at this stage of capitalism, that there's so little left, there's nothing left to lose, so you might as well, like even like, you know, sort of the, 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 the local one here, I guess, would be National Gallery in Armour. But like anybody who's been involved in any sort of you know institution in Ireland over the last ten years knows that it's our mark that has been feeding it, and then and as it has been for the last twenty years, been dealing with um, uh, sort of reception centres, <laughs> and uh, before that they were called Campbells. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, what year did Duncan Campbell win the? The oh, Turner, yeah. yes. So uh, Campbell's Catering, which became our mark. Uh, that, that that was uh, his family company. They were Beulies, and Beulies have had their own entertaining relationship with the property market in Dublin over the last 30, 40 years. And also, you know, that the, you know, inside Beulies there's the, um, the, the the glass, you know, the, the stained glass, Clark's uh, stained glass, which has now been uh, the, the Johnny Rowland who owns the building is trying to refer to it as fixtures and fittings which can be taken out like light bulbs. And it's actually kind of part of the visual, and we've got very little visual heritage in this country in terms of, you know, sort of 2D things. Mm -hmm. And so this is stuff that could just be skipped because it's like light bulbs, which I think is, is a fun way. So there's, there's some entertaining connections going on there, but simultaneously, especially, I think, whatever about in, if you didn't say with the, like the New York art world, which is so big, and, you know, like it's the middle of everything, it's the middle of the world in many respects for that. So there's a lot of entry points. Mm -hmm. In a country this size, there's very, very few entry points. So I think that I'm like, uh, it's the, f the first big example, a very obvious example of, especially when a, an institution like the National Gallery is spending a lot of money on contemporary art lately. Now, you know, the galleries have been throwing money at contemporary artists a fair bit over the last couple of years, but even beyond that, that you know, as opposed to being a uh, sort of a, 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 you know, a hoarder of, of, of curios, it has now, you know, like, you know, engaged a lot more living artists. So, you know, if you're going to go in and pile in and say, like, this is shit policy, 
that there's an element of, okay, well, I have given up any hope of being able to engage with this institution. It's like, you know, in the same way the institution of home ownership has become so distant, or even the institution of renting a place, it becomes increasingly distant to, to, to regular characters. There was a point whereby, as artists, even existing within dark matter, could access the world. You know, you could be there, that there was, you could, you could, I, I simply, you, you could have used four things. You could have a studio of some class, however cold it might be, but you could have a studio. Uh, but whereas now I'm like, you know, like, like we all know about what's going on, like with the Richmond Street Studios in Dublin. And I you know, I guess one of the things with that is that, you know, artists, you know, we, we say, look, you know, these are studios, the council should buy them and all the rest. But all that anyone has to say, oh yeah, we're going to build accommodation. You know, which is that's a that's a silver bullet. You know, we're building homes. You know, you know, you, know, you bloody artists. Yeah. And I think that our it's rather than it being so deeply pessimistic, has got to the point where by people that could have a sort of a position in capitalism and be artists within that. Uh, has that been you know through this new feudalism, this late capitalism, has that just been squeezed out so that we might as well resist? Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's. Uh, but it's 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 been true in my <clears throat> life in New York. I, I moved there in '77, and you could um, get a small grant. You could the rents were really cheap, and you could maybe maybe teach a class, and you would survive. You could make your art. You're fine. I mean, obviously, those days are just completely gone now. You know, it's absolutely gone. Um, this was in the end, this was just at the end of sort of what, you know, the welfare state, you might say, before neoliberalism fully kicks in. And you still had the idea that, you know, the National Endowment would provide money and then there would be little institutions that would redistribute the money and there was, and it wouldn't go necessarily just to like the top 10% of artists, it would go to lots and lots of people doing lots and lots of different kinds of things. And that concept is just pretty much gone, you know, pretty much gone. I think it's interesting to see, uh, like, it's very interesting to hear, like, from everyone. And I think we all, as you mentioned, like, there's, like, different entry points of activist art and, like, how we get involved. I think Ireland isn't really much of an activist country, like, uh, uh, in terms of, like, the art artistic aesthetic um, compared to America, because obviously there's a, a very big protest culture. Um, and I think that that's quite apparent now when we see. Um, how art is being used politically to evoke certain emotions through imagery, iconography, and visualization. So I want to ask in that, what do you believe are the fundamental signatures to be considered activist art? Is it a specific way that it needs to be completely defined as that? And how would you then define what activist, activist art is? Does it need to be connected to a political movement in order to be considered that? Or can it be non-political? Can there be, can activist art exist in the non-political realm? Or does it always need to be associated with a policy that needs to be reformed? I think one of the things that I found inter interesting is that Ireland is kind of looking back at its own art, art history and is bringing it back into this present day and evoking new questions within that. Um, maybe this art, had no reference to art, to, uh, to some form of policy. Um, for example, if we look, I'm just going to just give you a very blatant example, or just a blunt example, like uh, expressionism in Germany, um, basically like really big, broad colours, very like urban, and enjoying the ideas of modernism. And then um, you, could, you could take that and apply it into the everyday life and then explain that it was a political movement of, 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 of moving away from rural parts and um, you know in fully investing into the modernist aspect and then capitalism for example and how it's now destroying communities so we can actually like take art from the past and reapply it and then recontextualize it i mean could that be considered another problem with activist art is that it could actually manipulate what art was before um, i know there's a few questions but they we all kind of connect in some way yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll just uh, just two things. Um, 
I try to sort of define activist art at the beginning after I present like Lucy's definition and, and Groy's and some other things. Uh, and I sort of do come down on the side that it tends to be, um, you know, at least more a sort of engaged, militantly engaged, let's say, or sort of protest culture is more the realm of what I'm going to talk about, as opposed to, say, for example, the kind of work where you're really developing, let's say, community relations, which I've done in other other essays and other books, like artist social action is pretty much about that aspect of, of art. Um, but then I also contradict myself uh, somewhat early on and say, but on the other hand, uh, take for example, uh, in Afghanistan, there was a group of artists who were going around painting murals of young girls, you know, celebrating a certain amount of freedom and other things on the walls. Uh, they weren't explicitly political, really, in that sense, they were more celebratory. But then, of course, the moment the Taliban takes over again and they start to whitewash them, they become a sort of a form of activist art, you know. So it's contextual too, you know. Um, I mean, we often talk about, say, Picasso's Guernica as an interesting example of what is it activist art? Is it political art? And usually, I come down to the side. It's a, it's a work of political art because he represented the angst and the anger and the emotions, right? Uh, and it, nevertheless, was a canvas, and it has to be taken care of, and it has to be, you know, it has a certain dimensions and. And nevertheless, it's so often been used, like the image I showed uh, of the street, street stencil, right? The imagery has this mobility, this is to your second you know, point, that gets uh, revitalized, reanimated, reactivated over and over again. So I'm not, I don't think there is like an absolute crisp way to talk about this, you know? And I think that's important, that it, it is contextual and it also changes. Um, and I do come down on the side that, you know, if, if you think in terms of this idea of like a sort of phantom archive, it's like here in this room of ideas and bits and pieces and things that have happened and not worked or have worked that we may have some sense of, we may have a very good sense of, we're drawing on that, we're actually in a sense reusing that, reanimating that, reimagining that stuff all the time. And that's kind of where I think things kind of play out in terms of activist art. It really is a process of a kind of repetition of what is, you know, sometimes even a kind of repair. And I'll explain that. Uh, one of the chapters I took out that will hopefully appear in, in, in another book uh, talks about the fact that the Haitian Revolution, let's say, or other kind of slave uh, rebellions that took place in the uh, late, well, Haitian Revolution is very early, late 1700s, early 1800s, but they, it goes on up into, you know, the late uh, 19th century. Haitian Revolution photography was not invented yet, right? But later on, the camera was probably available for a lot of things that happened in different parts of the world. But the camera wasn't that accessible. I mean, it was still an expensive piece of equipment. And so if you try to look up slave rebellions, let's say in a Google image search, you'll get a lot of engravings and maybe some paintings and things of this sort. There's very little photography that's related to that era. In 2019, uh, the artist Dred Scott, American artist, did a slave rebellion reenactment in Louisiana, in near New Orleans. Uh, based on an actual slave uprising that took place in that area, which was not really Louisiana at the time, but it was, you know, would become Louisiana. And men and women just like threw down their, like, well, walked off the plantation. They took whatever things they could use, tools and things that they were using in the sugar plantation as weapons, and they started marching towards the city, which would be New Orleans, and, uh, you know, with the idea they were going to overthrow, you know, the local government, and, you know, they killed a number of plantation owners, and, and of course, it fails. I mean, ultimately, a militia is raised, and within a day or so, it's, it's over. So, so Scott uh, creates literally a performative work based on this idea, and he goes down and he has people making clothes for that period, weapons, get horses, and does the whole thing and has a film crew making like a film of the whole project as well. Uh, two things to note, one is now it's, it's also known as Cancer Alley, this particular part of Louisiana, because there's all the sort of petrochemical industry located there, processing plants, 
And of course, it's very poor, mostly black, and people have like enormously high rates of cancer because they're in like the worst polluted part of you know the region. So he has this this image of like this 19th century army of black people marching through the, the countryside in a way, just on the outskirts of New Orleans, with these gigantic petrochemical plants in the background. And if you do a, a search on, for slave rebellions, guess what pops up? The photographs that pop up are from his work. Right? And so in my mind, it's like he's actually gone in and sort of like strangely done a, like a repair job on the archive that was missing this imagery in a certain sense, right? Um, and it's not a repair like, like that closes it or fixes it because it's obviously impossible, but it's a repair that creates a sense of like using activist art to sort of not just comment on the injustice, right, of slavery or of current day, uh, you know, uh, racism, but the very concept of history and its representation is, is sort of drawn into that, that problem. So, I don't know if that comes back to what you're saying. Yeah, no, it does. I mean, like, it's like, I guess the idea of aestheticized communication, do you know, this idea that without language we are able to comment on society or, or highlight certain things, mm -hmm. as I mentioned with the photographs. Um, I think that's the double-edged sword of technology is that we can easily access information now, but we can also be desensitized from it. Mm -hmm. And um, just the repetition, proliferation of it, how much we can consume and how much we can internalize and how much we can then digest and then communicate or uh, kind of discuss it. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that make I guess that that's why I was very fascinated by the idea of like, you know, the artist is the activist, are they is it is it their duty to be an activist? You know, maybe they want to be an artist, but then somehow through their work they mm -hmm. kind of become activated as an activist almost. Um, that's an interesting question, but I don't have an answer for that. Um, like what level of responsibility or ethics maybe or sense of outrage I don't know that's a question for everybody here I think you know. it's a good time for me to say that I've got a great time okay <laughs> you're, you're getting active yeah <laughs> thanks for being here yeah 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 um, I think we're Is this about done yeah okay Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, listen. I hope I hope to see most of you or some of you, and then uh, we'll continue the conversation. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.